Welcome brainstormers to the Property Management Brainstorm Show. I'm Bob Preston, your host, and I'm broadcasting from our studio at North County Property Group in Del Mar, California. If you're new here, please consider to subscribe because you wanna have ongoing access to all of our great episodes. And if you like what you hear, pay it forward with a positive review. On this episode of Property Management Brainstorm, the focus will be on what it takes to build and grow a property management business from the ground up and the importance of the support provided by our national organization, which is called the National Association of Residential Property Managers, otherwise known as NARPM, N-A-R-P-M. Today's guest on the show is none other than Kelly Tollefson, owner of T-Square Properties in Washington State which she has grown from the ground up and also is the president, the national president of our industry organization, which I just mentioned, NARPM. Kelly is also, in addition to that, a mentor and coach for hire. So we will get into that a bit too. Kelly, hey, I don't think any of us in the property management business said as kids, I want to be a property manager when I grow up, right? And I always got to laugh about that. But you've been on a journey yourself. And I'd love to hear that about you, your background, and how you started in property management. That is a great, a great comment. I have, my husband and I have three children and not one of them has said as they've watched it and grown up in it, that they want to be property managers. So you're right. I don't think <laughs> even knowing about it. I sucked it, my son into it, by the way. He now works we at the haven't, company. We <laughs> haven't been able to do it yet. We do have a daughter that's in the industry, but not here in our company. She's works uh, in Idaho. So um, you're right. For us, it started out as just as as a personal investment plan for us. Um, My husband decided that he would get his broker's license and work his way actually in Southern California. Uh, We lived down in Mission Viejo for a couple years right after we first got married and he found some HUD foreclosures and that was the niche that we we kind of logged into and, and followed that track for a while. And then as we started building a family and I became a stay at home mom, It gave us great flexibility to be able to turn properties, earn an income uh, while my husband was working in the corporate world and build a little portfolio for ourselves. And um, we got to know so much about it that we decided, wow, we could maybe do this as a business. And so again, still staying home, you know, neighbors came over and one neighbor came over one time and said, Hey, I'm moving to Eastern Washington. I have five rentals. I know you guys have some, can you rent them? Can you manage them for me? And we kind of said, yeah, I think we can. And so that built and built and built. And so brick by brick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was a much better land. I'm a much better manager for other people than a landlord for myself. I I'm just a softy when it comes to dealing with tenants and stuff. So my wife says that about me regarding maintenance of our home. (laughs) Take care of all these homes. Why can't you uh, keep ours maintained? You know, that's so true. It's like the cobbler's uh, children have no shoes, right? So, okay. So you built properties brick by brick. I understand you guys also at T-Square from T-Square. Um, you do HOAs as well. We I'm do, curious. yes. And that How was you got another... into that and what that first step into HOA life was like. That it was another kind of accident, kind of, you know, I think a lot of us uh, that have a management company and have gotten into this as a business, third party managers, it, we got into it almost by accident. You know, like you said, nobody wakes up and says, uh, well, there are some people who do it very intentionally. However, um, so that happened with our HOA management as well. We had a, a fourplex in Seattle call us and say, um, hey, do you guys do management of associations? And I just had a conversation with them and I thought to myself, well, it can't be that different than managing yeah. rental properties. And back then, 15, 16 years ago, it was very different. Um, and today that we did start managing that fourplex and then we, we actually, um, again, a funny story, we, we lost a bookkeeper at a sudden, she had lost her mother suddenly and had to exit the workforce and go take care of that whole situation. And, and so I called a friend of mine that I knew through PTA and our kids played together. And I said, Hey, Teresa, are you interested in coming and doing some bookkeeping for us? And, um, you know, filling in and she said, sure. And then we got this fourplex during that period and she really took to it, started kind of managing that. And now she's our, uh, vice president of community associations and managing wow. a team of seven people. And 
Uh, we're, we manage about 86 associations, about 4,000 doors. My so goodness. Wow. That's a, that's, that's a cool story about her. And uh, I'm sure she yeah. knows a lot about bookkeeping and, and when it comes to associations. Well, hey, what's it been like along the way? I mean, I think this has been many years, you know, since you started your company and now you're at this uh, place in your life and your business. What were some of the hurdles you faced and what's, it, what's the trip been like along the way? So um, I think, you know, it may, some may say it's unique. Uh, I know there's a lot of business owners and a lot of property managers, and maybe it's all different industries, but in our industry, working with family, my husband and I built uh, T-Square together. I started it while he was still working the corporate world and putting food on the table and paying the mortgage while we kind of built up the business. But mm -hmm. since that was only about a year and then we took, he came on board and that's been one of the challenges is working with family. Um, you know, there's a definitely a fine line of communication and when do you stop that communication at home and keep it at, at work and where does that blending come into play? And that's, that's one of the unique things that I've experienced. I think the other thing in building your own business is that it needs to take on your own, your own personality. You know, everybody runs their businesses differently. You know, we talk about a portfolio style and then we talk about a departmental style. We talk about employees mm -hmm. or 1099 folks that work for you and uh, or W2 or 1099 folks. And I think it all gets down to what's your true style and where can you thrive and have your business thrive in those unique opportunities. Um, you know, just in, in my experience in the last year uh, being president elect and then this year president talking to different people, um, you know, just learning about how people are doing it. There's so many different ways to skin a cat, if you will, that, uh, knowing, knowing what that style is that helps you get to the next level, I guess, is probably one of the things I've learned. Yeah, you know, I, I like to compare to their strategies and tactics. And, and those things are how you price, how you could, you know, do your pricing, how you show properties, uh, what you do in terms of your accounting, um, how you communicate with the owners, all that's, you know, kind of your strategies and tactics, the basic blocking and tackling of property management. But I like to think that companies who have a solid foundation in some guiding principles or maybe personal values are the ones that really have that foundation that can make it through all the years and are built to last and weather the storm. And it seems like you kind of have that same philosophy. We do. Um, and we actually went in, a, I guess if I had, you know, there's so many things that you, you sit back after you've had a, worked on your company and you've worked in your company for so long and you think, gosh, I wish I would have known this sooner or you know, I wish I would have written down all the processes as I was doing them instead of like pulling my hair out, trying to do everything all at the same time. And um, we have developed over the years guiding what we call guiding principles. And basically yeah. for us, what it is, is when you when you don't know what to do, when you you can't decide or it doesn't, it's not a clear decision. What are our guiding principles? And so we've got eight of them. I, you know, they're on our website and we actually have filled out or uh, had our team come up with an, an acronym and it's actually meat ribs. And so it's um, mutual <laughs> respect. Uh, let's see, I had to pull them out to get them all. Um, enjoyment, accountability, transparency. Uh, let's see, the B is betterment. S is selflessness, you know, responsiveness, all those kinds of things. And it's not so much the word, but it's the characteristic behind it. So betterment is making the job and our careers better for one another while at the same time that creates a betterment for the company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the integrity, the transparency, how much, you know, letting the owners and clients or clients and tenants and vendors see exactly what we're doing. We have nothing to hide. Wow. So. That foundation sounds really similar to what we have here at my company as well. I'm a big believer in that. I have a company culture chart that's up, you know, in our main office yeah. entrance area, our guiding principles are right there. And I always show it to people who come in interview because I just tell them up front, look, if you can't, you know, if you can't live to these standards, if you work here, then maybe this isn't the place for you. You know, right. I, mean, I think that's, that kind of has to be the way it is. We right? got, yeah, so, we got a big poster up in our lunchroom kind of thing. So everybody sees it. Well, pre COVID, everyone would see it every day. Right. When they <laughs> yeah. Has that been part of the challenge, finding the right people to fit within your company culture and your high standards? Huge. And, and right. I, I, for us, we had a one employee um, voluntarily leave for another opportunity in 2017. And it wasn't until about probably at least two years 
that we could write the ship and not just that position. It just seemed it was one person after another, after another, either um, we weren't, uh, we weren't hiring the right person or there was somebody else looking for something else. And I don't know if it was a function of the unemployment rate because it was so low through that period of time, 2017 to 2019, but we had a major shift in our company benefits. We started a fund committee. We really, I really started focusing on culture because we were meeting the salary requirements of people, but there was just something, I'm not sure if it was us or them or what it was or the combination of everything, but yes, keeping the right people on the right spot, the right seat on the bus has been really difficult. And I have to say right now, of all the work we've put into it as a team and myself and the, you know, the books I've read, you know, the, the, the networking I've done with the NARPM and so on, um, I think we're in a really good spot now to have a great team and we're all rowing in the same direction and we're all seeing the same vision and it's really been hard work to get here, but I, every day I cross my fingers hoping that it won't, the, the apple cart won't get upset again. Yeah, the parallels that, you know, listening to you talk, the parallels between your journey and the journey I've had here with my company are so similar because you, you can, <laughs> excuse me, you can have great guiding principles and values as a company, but it doesn't necessarily translate into culture unless your people are willing to take that baton and integrate it into the workplace, right? You can't just snap your fingers and expect your team to, you know, recite these values in this company culture at gunpoint, right? So, right. Um, yeah, I think the same thing. I think uh, one by one, though, if you can get the right people in place, then over the course of time, whether it's by osmosis or whatever, you're your company will just eventually ooze and, and you know, uh, emit this cultural, that, cultural and, and state of values that people can feel when they come into the company or right. even when they call on the phone, right? Yeah. And so I get that now. I get, I get people complimenting the company like, oh, my God, your people are fantastic. How would you find such good people? And Well, not easy, right? It's yeah, a long, it's long <laughs> haul and a long journey and I think to get there. I think it's an upward spiral, you know, when, when it just yeah. like the downward spiral happens, it's contagious, both, both directions. And I think um, one of the things I've noticed even recently with, you know, our big concern when COVID happened was people, you know, working from home and what was that going to look like? Cause as company owners and property managers, I'm, I'm a self admitted control person, right? I don't like to necessarily <laughs> freak, but I like to have control of things. And, um, whenever now that everybody's home there's so much more communication going on um like a leasing agent might be out doing a move in and she'll find something that's not going right or a move out and sees it you know we she sent a picture the other day of this skanky looking shower floor and we could all chime in and she could feel a part of a team with our chat with the team's chat that we use and um you know there's a lot of humor going on there's just the support and i feel like now our team culture is so much stronger because we have this ongoing communication that wasn't there pre-COVID. Yeah, but you have the people in place now and the culture in place before COVID hit to allow that True. to flourish, right? Yes. And uh, I was really nervous about it as well. In fact, when COVID hit, I, I started having daily Zoom calls, you know, talk about being a control freak. I mean, every yeah. morning at nine o'clock, right? And then I'm realizing, okay, wait a minute, you know, these people are super motivated. They're all doing their job. Let's go to twice a week, you know, and now it's yeah. kind of back to our norm, which is a once a week staff meeting. Right. Hey, that was a really great snapshot into your background and your perspective on property management. I'd like to shift gears here and talk a little bit about NARPM. So yes. you're kind of the big kahuna here, right? Yeah. You got the, you know, the president of NARPM in the house, and we're so <laughs> glad you're on the brainstorm. I would just love to hear what your take is on NARPM, and maybe you could just tell our listeners in the nutshell what NARPM is all about. So NARPM, the National Association of Residential Property Managers, for those of you that aren't members, um, I have a girlfriend that thinks it sounds like a disease, NARPM, but it isn't a disease. If it is, I hope everyone catches it because it's, right. it's, it's good, one of the best organizations that I stumbled upon. I, I'll never forget, you know, actually it was in this very room before we had an office outside of the house when I had a tenant, I didn't know what to deal with. And I, you know, back, I think this was pre Google. I, I don't, it was 15 years ago. I don't even know what search engine it was. And looking on the internet for how, how do I get rid of a tenant or how do I find support as a landlord? And there was all these tenant advocacy groups. And I stumbled across NARPM at that time. And it was 2005. 
And I said, wow, this looks like a great organization. It's a landlord or, or management company support organization, right? And so I was able to get some information. I was able to get plugged into my local King County Seattle chapter. And it was almost like, um, uh, like the sky, the clouds parted and yeah. the sun came down and the rays were on me and the veil was lifted whatever the yeah, yeah the veil was yeah. lifted. like oh my <laughs> gosh look at this wealth of information not only the wealth of information that was so fascinating to me um but it was the amount the the level of sharing that people were willing to do my background is at ford motor company when i got out of college i started working at um within the sales and marketing division in california in the san francisco bay area for a Ford Motor Company. That is not a company that shares secrets. Nobody no, shares no. <laughs> dealers, you know, the, I would call on the dealerships and, you know, that was my, I was the factory rep, you know, sending, shipping cars to them and so on. And they don't share secrets. So I'll never forget my very first convention. It was in Salt Lake City. And I was um, there and I was thinking, I think this, I got the feeling that maybe this might be kind of similar to a used car salesman kind of group. And uh, it was one of the most professional organizations and professional group of people I'd ever been exposed to. And I felt like um, they call it, the, we call it in NARPA the fire hose experience, where you go to a meeting or a convention or even sometimes a chapter meeting, but our conference, the state conference or something, you get so much information that you just, it's almost overwhelming. And, and that to me is what NARPM is. There's just a, a plethora of information and it's just, it's almost difficult to pare it down to what am I looking for over the years now, um, you know, there's the Facebook groups and there's all kinds of different ways of getting the information and the, the website has really come a, a long way in that time. That, that was my NARPM journey. And the minute I started meeting people, I was hooked. I, I just, they, they were so helpful. Everyone was like, oh, you need this? Oh, you don't know how to handle this? Oh, you're having an audit? Let me help you. You know, those, everything. And it has continued this way. It hasn't waned at all. And you've been in NARPM now for 15 years or so, you said? 15 years. Yeah, yeah this year it was 15 years. I'm always able to, regardless of the event, whether it be a chapter meeting or a, you know, a, a call where I jump in, maybe something you guys have done through National, I'm always able to pull several what I call nuggets, right? Like, huh, that is really interesting. You know, that's something I've got to try to do either, you know, maybe I've tried to do it right then quickly, or maybe it's something I might not be able to do until our company kind of reaches the next step. But it always plants these really cool seeds and ideas, you know, yes. for, for the business. And that's, that's, the, and that, that's the thing, Bob, is um, like right now I might need, um, especially let's just use this, you know, pre or post COVID experience. I might need some sort of an inspection app that maybe I didn't need a year ago because I had this great system that was working really well. I, I didn't need to change it. Things were working. So now I've got this something I need to do because the circumstances are changing and the market is changing and our world is changing. I know I can find it at NARPM. I know I can either find yeah. someone that's doing it or I can find the company that's doing it or several companies that are doing it that I can reach out to. Um, you know, I get, there's all, I reach out and people reach out to me about different things I'm doing and what, what are they doing? And it's just, um, I don't know. It's a beautiful synergy of, of a knowledge, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. Yeah. Property, the property management business has a lot of systems in it, right? Systems and processes. And over time I found in my company, as the company's grown, those tend to break because the legacy way of doing things maybe isn't keeping up with the pace of your company growth, or as you said, the market changes, or maybe the responsiveness people expect. So, you know, having access to all these cool solutions from our affiliate partners and from people's experience in implementing them has been really fantastic for me. I know it's been a big, big benefit. So look, you've been involved now at NARPM for many years, and you've now kind of come up through leadership, I guess, the question is, what motivated you to get involved in NARPM leadership? And now, how has it been as the national president? I mean, that's a pretty big role. It is. It is. And uh, what motivated me, it was almost like uh, um, the more I got, the more I wanted to give back. And the more I gave back, the more I received. So it was this, you know, uh, spiral 
the more I wanted to get involved, the more I wanted to show others and, and be a part of the demonstration of how beneficial this organization can be. And it's not a perfect organization, but most everyone gains something from it. And, and I, I contend I've always been, been a believer that what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. But yeah. I wanted to be able to give back. And as, the more I gave back, the more, again, I received. And so it just kept spiraling and spiraling. And so I um, just continued on through the journey. I actually applied for the Northwest RVP five, four times, five times. I think I was approved. I was appointed or nominated the fifth time. So I was really very set on, on being able to give back and to learn and, and, take that knowledge and pass it on. That's interesting. Cause you know, I got more interested. I, I will tell you when I first started my business and I heard about NARPUM, I was so busy and so consumed with my business that I didn't have time to really even join. I think I joined for a while and then I sort of dropped out and I never really got involved. And then it wasn't until a few years ago that I really started embracing it. And Part of that was because I had I had the ability to do that because I built a, a you know we kind of talked about our team building I had a better team that allowed me some headroom to be able to go go do that so I guess what would you say to those people like I used to be you know <laughs> the people are like yeah. well hey I don't have time why would I want to do NARP and what's your plea to them I guess so, uh, for joining I think uh, to be frank I think people you you can't not, you, you are spending more time not joining because you're not learning about the more efficient ways, the more um, effective ways to do things, or, or even just getting the knowledge. You know, one of the things I'll, I will never forget, and maybe you recall this in your early career, is oftentimes when you're building your business, you're doing it, you're by yourself, you don't have anybody else on your team, and you feel like you're this lone person without a life jacket in the middle of this stormy sea. And going to the meetings and just even now, you know, just talking to my NARPM friends and uh, people that I've, I've become really good friends with, I've, I don't feel alone. And I think that feeling alone um, or that not feeling, having that kind of a, um, a solution of not feeling alone helps you uh, traject further. It, it helps you move forward and gives you the confidence that, hey, somebody else has been on this in this boat and I'm not here by myself and someone's traveled this road. I know I can do it because I can see these people doing it and maybe they could pull me along or maybe I can offer them something. So I think, I think it costs someone more not to join, even though there's a financial implication and a time implication. But I do, I hear that a lot. I don't have time. I bet if you were to carve out an hour a month, I mean, or two hours a month, you could find it. And, and I would challenge people to look at that and say, you're missing out on so much and so much rich content by not joining that you're, it's a disservice not to join. Does that make sense? Totally. I mean, yeah. I think the, you hit on it a little bit earlier, the networking aspects of NARPM and just listening to other people and how they've approached things has been so beneficial for me. And look, let's face it, you find people in NARPM that you can relate to and you could admire and you want to maybe model your company the way they have, or maybe it's their philosophies. And then there's some others that, hey, well, not so much, right? But I mean, I think being able to, to find that path and, and to see, okay, that's someone who I could aspire to be, or that's a company that I would like to consider myself in that class of an organization. I mean, having those kind of comparatives is, uh, you know, really important. And I think a great mm -hmm. outcome of, of certainly of, of being in, being in NARPM. So um, COVID has obviously hurt some of the networking aspects. I've, one thing I've noticed from national is you guys seem to be, maybe this is part of your leadership, but I've seen you national being much more communicative this year. Is that part of the strategy? And has that changed, I guess, I, the COVID-19? I will take a little credit for that because when we first, when COVID-19 first hit, the first thing, you know, I was um, communicating with Gail Phillips, our CEO, and Scott mm -hmm. Abernathy, our president-elect, quite a bit and the, the rest of the board as much as, as we could. Um, but my first thing was, I don't wanna just be a talking head out there. It seemed like everyone, you know, a whole uh, vacuum was filled on the Zoom platform and everyone was talking. And we strategically said, let's not do just everything everyone else is doing. Let's find, and I was, I don't know about you or your listeners, overwhelmed with the amount of information coming at me. Mm -hmm. And so what we talked about was let's have a, a 
COVID-19 landing page resource page on the website and it's right there. Anyone can get to it. Um, and let's have members send their stuff in or we'll, we'll grab it and links from here and there that, you know, there were podcasts and Facebook lives everywhere and forms flying everywhere and conversations everywhere. And to me, it was overwhelming. And part of it, part of what I strive for with my own organization and with NARPM is um, transparency. There's a lot of fear out there about what's going on. And Yes, we do pride ourselves on the networking, but we also pride ourselves on the professionalism of the organization and all the other, you know, the ethics of the organization and, um, you know, the education part of it. The offering, we're offering all of the classes online now, live Zoom courses. So it's not a webinar, it's, it's a live Zoom class. And um, that's something I'm really proud of that we were able to pivot really quickly with a whole like 20 instructors that were available, became available as soon as they could to uh, go from the classroom to the virtual classroom, the live classroom to virtual. And um, the education is something I think that we've done a really good job with. And we're looking at maybe redesigning those courses to make them more interactive so that when they are virtual, we can still continue that platform moving forward, even when we can start meeting in person. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I you, I think you know this. I'm uh, I just took office as the Cal NARPM president. Right? Yes, and uh, that was one of my goals was to communicate more. And I just have noticed that National is doing such a great job. I'm not sure how much room there really is for me <laughs> well, to improve that's upon the thing. it. You got to be uh, really strategic, right? I you, know you don't yeah. want to say what everybody else is saying. You want to have content and. So it's, it, it's a tough call sometimes. And I've tried to do it maybe just with one or two minute videos because I think that's kind of what people are responding to and what they'll, they'll hear. Right. Too, so. I think that's great. I mean, uh, and I think the education aspects of NARPM too. I mean, let's face it, there aren't that many educational opportunities for property managers. There certainly aren't here in California through our Department of Real Estate. Not to knock them. I mean, they're focused more on brokers, you know, selling, listing properties, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And while property management does fall under that regulation, there's just, you know, there's no place to really go. It's very, very basic. So that is a place where NARP NARPM really, you know, stands out. Yeah. Right. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people join is to, well, and you don't have to be a member to take the education classes, but a lot of states will offer it as CE, continuing education, yeah. especially, you know, pre-COVID, a lot of the states would offer it, um, the live classes, and, and we're still looking into uh, how we can get those virtually approved for virtual classes for continuing ed as right. well. So one of the areas in California where I feel we can really help our membership stay educated is on legislative and legal updates and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, state of California is this incredibly, incredibly diverse state. I mean, I know most states are, but I mean, these kind of micro markets of real right. estate and uh, economies. And so, yeah, that's one of my goals for the year. But what about nationally? How do you, how do you, you know, what, what role does NARPM play in keeping people updated on legislation at the national level? And that's got to be all encompassing. Can't imagine. Well, it's been a great, a great pro progression of involvement um, with NARPM at the national level. And, you know, one of the, well, our, our mission, our vision, excuse me, is to be the recognized leader in the property management, residential property management industry. And so in order to do that, we have to have a seat at the table at any legislative table, right? Yeah. Especially nationally. So we, over the years, we've hired a full-time lobbyist and now he has an assistant and um, we are, cre you know, we've created our PAC, our political action committee, and we're making donations to different um, campaigns that way. And um, I think we're making headway. We're being recognized um, with, with other large organizations to partner with. So for example, NAA is now, you know, recognizing NARPM and has been for a little while as part of that fabric of uh, or the landscape of residential management. It's not just mm -hmm. all apartments. There's, you know, millions and millions of single family home rentals out there. And we represent sure. as property managers, managers, we represent it. Um, and our goal is to, is to understand what's going on to advocate for the property rights that, that we believe in as property managers. And, um, you know, make sure that, that we're educated as managers as well on, on the legislative items going on. So is HUD a big point of contact with you guys? Have you met them? It has you become over the years. Yeah, <laughs> it's been actually last year. Uh, we didn't get to have a live legislative conference this year, but last year, yeah, we sat down with uh, 
one of the secretaries of HUD and we're mm -hmm. able to talk about uh, service animals with them and how it's been affecting our businesses and how it's yeah. been taken for granted or taken advantage of in some markets. And they were well aware of it, but maybe not to the extent. A little shout out to PetScreening.com. John Bradford's done a great job in, yeah. in you know, developing statistics that HUD can use in that arena. So it's been, it's been great. So you're at the national level, you have, you know, the association uh, across the country, where exactly, I mean, I, I kind of let a leak, I'm the president of Calmar Fund, but where does the local chapters, you know, kind of the regional city chapters, if you will, fit in as well as the state chapters within NARPM? So the, we've got uh, 60, I think 63 state or local and state chapters. And um, we are, developing other state, what we call state chapters or chapters in formation. We have some chapters that just can't survive based on the, the standards of a nonprofit. And then we have others that are thriving. So right now, um, well, Washington state has a new chapter. It, it came out of its chapter in formation and became a state chapter. You have to be a chapter in formation for two to four years. Colorado is one. I know Arizona is working on it. Um, and there's other states that are taking that. And, and mostly, the local chapters, I see them as a, um, an avenue of knowledge and networking for the local property manager. The state is more of what we might consider the at-large members who don't have a mm -hmm. local chapter nearby. Well, now the boundaries are all gone. I mean, you don't have to travel to make a chapter meeting now because most everybody's doing it on Zoom. So even if you live three hours away, you can still attend that chapter meeting. Um, so to me, there's no boundaries, which I think is really cool. So those at large members that we serve who don't have an affiliation to a local chapter can now participate a little bit easier and get that knowledge and that networking going on. That's interesting. You know, I've noticed that in California because you get above the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, there's no local NARPM chapters, right? There's, a there's, Santa, so, Rosa, there's Santa Rosa. And, yeah, there's Sonoma and Santa yeah. Rosa, I think, in there. But you get above kind of that area and, and uh, up further, and there's no, there's no Central Valley. So, right. yeah, I think there's a big need, exactly kind of what you're talking about. I see it as a great advantage, uh, this, you know, if you're looking for silver lining, is that we can take these, uh, this information that we, and our platform, if, like our networking and our education and our professionalism and all that stuff, and it is just, can go anywhere now. So I have to ask this because I've noticed a difference between being the leader of a volunteer group and managing my own company, right? I mean, look, NARPM's a bunch of volunteers. So how have you found that to be? And what are the subtle differences you found? You know, um, I think, well, first of all, a volunteer can just walk away without any repercussions, right? Your, your, your employees can too, I guess, or your team on, on with your company can too. I just, I think that I, I really honestly haven't had much of a difference with the volunteers that I work with. And, and maybe it's because the ones I'm in touch with are so committed, right? It, it's all, I don't know. It, it's like you drank the Kool-Aid and you want it the best for the organization and you know, that's why you get a salary is you do your best for the company you're working for the return on the NARPM side. And maybe I've got rose colored glasses on and I'm not seeing everything, but I just see a lot of people that are really committed, that are dedicated to making NARPM as best as it can be. And not even just on a global level, but those they come in contact with, right? That you're, you know, you're moving into this position because you want to affect as many people as possible to have the knowledge that you have so that they can make their lives better, right? And easier and yeah. more fun. Property management is way more fun with NARPM than it's not. That's interesting. I, I find myself in preparing for our meetings and whatnot, I find myself being almost more organized for the NARPM organization and our meetings than I am for, within my own company, right? I mean, I could, I could do our own company almost blindfolded. And so I find myself just wanting to be really respectful of people's time. I think that's one aspect and, and being super organized when I bring them all together. So yeah. I don't, I don't, you know, waste a bunch of their time. Um, but you know, sometimes like, like we've talked about, people are there for the social aspect and the networking and you got to kind of got to let that fly too, or it's maybe within my company. I would. <laughs> right. But there are, I, I think there are some, some different, I, I guess I was looking at it as how I, how I see 
the people I work with on both sides, you know, the nonprofit or the volunteers versus the employees. And I, I, I'm seeing a lot of volunteers that are just ready, willing, and able to give back. And it's, it's really inspiring for me. So that's amazing. Now, what about community service or giving back? You, you, you just kind of mentioned giving back to NARPM, but NARPM's doing some things as well, right? Can you tell right. us about that? So, yeah. So every year, it's about, I think about 10 years ago, the past presidents came up with an idea to do a, a charity and golf outing to pick a, a past president's charity and golf outing. Two years ago, it started with Eric Weatherington, our immediate past president, where he actually got to pick the charity because he was the one going around the country talking about it. And rather than the past presidents picking it, let's let the president pick it. So I got to pick uh, the Alexander Hamilton Scholars. And that's an organization wow. that bridges the gap between um, college or high school and college for kids that are, you know, outstanding achievement, community service, and giving back to their communities, but don't have the means to necessarily get to college. And it's not a scholarship program. It's more of a mentor and education program. And they, they join a cohort right out of high school, and they go with this cohort all through college and into career. So it's, uh, it's really been, a, it's just like Alexander Hamilton started from nothing and built his himself from nothing. And this is just a little step up and and instead of a handout to these kids. That's incredible. Um, really great. Um, yeah, really great charity and worthy cause maybe some future property managers in that mix. Who knows? You know, or yeah, maybe um, there may be our company owners or well, I'm not sure. Um, you know, one of the other things I'm seeing a lot of Bob with the local chapters is they're doing their own local chap local charities, you yeah. know, whether it be a food bank or Habitat for Humanity. Um, those kinds of things, a lot of the local chair, local chapters will pick a charity for the year and focus on it. Um, and that's been really impactful across the country. We don't hear about those as often as we do, obviously, the national, national charity. So I want to talk, uh, if we can shift here a little bit, I want to talk about a couple of events that are coming up that are, that are brought to us as part of the membership through, through NARPM. One of them is the national convention that's coming up. Now, you, one of the big events of the year is the broker owner conference. It's intended for the owners or the people who are running their businesses. That got canceled, right? Mm -hmm. That was early on, I think in April within the pandemic. And, you know, good on national for can canceling that. I don't, I don't think there was any choice on that one. But we have another one coming up, I believe, in October, right? Which is the national yes. convention. Right. Um, scheduled for Amelia Island in Florida. Florida is one of the hotspots. I know you've done a, a virtual alternative to that. Maybe you can tell yes. us about what's, what's going to happen, what your expectations are. How do you think it's going to go? I'm just kind of curious to hear, hear you talk about it. Yeah, so we're, you know, I'm sure like many organizations out there, uh, we're, we're planning for what we're calling a hybrid event um, where we would have those that want to travel and participate be there in person. And then those that don't and can't or you know, it isn't possible, you know, not just because of the disease necessarily of COVID-19, but maybe it's because their kids are having to stay home and be um, schooled at home. And so they can't get away and so on. So there's all kinds of repercussions as to why. However, we're really excited about offering the virtual component of the convention. Um, we're working with all of the speakers that we, we were planning on having at the convention. We actually have been in touch with Damon John, who had agreed to move his appearance from the broker owner to the convention. Right. So we're working with that. Um, and we're looking at, we've invested quite a bit um, in finding a platform that will facilitate an optimal experience and give us the everything that we look for. And I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say it's going to be, oh, it's just the same as being there in person. It's not. We, right. we, it's just not a way we can, I wish we could make that happen. And um, as far as the virtual component isn't going to feel the same as being there, but we're going to do our best and we're working with uh, different uh, vendors to make that happen as best we can highest what's level the, what's the registration been like so far and what's the split been between you know in-person attendance and and virtual do you know yet you know i i don't have specific numbers on that um we are actually having a board meeting on thursday and i will have those details then i know there's been lots of registrations on both sides i just don't have those numbers for you yeah. today i'm sorry well i can tell you cal narpum's eagerly watching because we have our our conference, our state conference at the end of May, uh, March in 2021. And we're yeah. trying to figure out what to do. It's scheduled for Napa Valley, California. Um, but, you know, gosh, are we going to be able to pull that off live? 
or do we go all virtual or, or, or hybrid? I mean, these are all questions yeah. we have to answer. So we're eagerly awaiting um, kind of to follow hopefully the lead of national. Hey, there's also this cool event coming up, uh, gosh, in just about a week on the 24th and 25th of August, which NARPM yeah. is sponsoring and hosting. Yeah. The PM Leadership Exchange. Tell us about that and why should people think about attending? So the PM Leadership Exchange is uh, kind of the, sec I don't know how many of your listeners have li been on any of the Second Nature um, leadership or PM Exchange events. They started right in April and they did about three of them. And then they've done a couple other uh, mini events, but they are taking this one to the next level. Um, I was actually on a Facebook Live this morning where Onsite Pros was giving away some tickets to the PM Leaders leadership exchange and andrew was there and he andrew smallwood from yeah. second nature talking about it and he was uh, my last guest <laughs> he was he was on the show uh, last week so so your listeners probably know a little bit about what, yeah. what's going on um but we i am super excited that that he uh, that second nature asked narpum to sponsor it because it gives us an opportunity to move that that Hamilton Scholars uh, charity to the next level and they've committed to quite a bit of attention there and they've got some great surprises coming into that event um, for that but also the amount of networking that they've they're working on and putting together it's not going to be your typical zoom uh, small rooms from what I understand I haven't seen it but um, I'm super excited about it and I think it'll be a really great uh, way to elevate the vision of what property management looks like and what NARPM can participate in going yeah, forward. Yeah, I'm excited to attend too. I'm going to attend and I'm, uh, again, you know, in, in the spirit of wanting to see what other people are doing with their, I, I wouldn't call this a convention, but it's a really great educational opportunity. I'm excited to to attend and, and kind of see what it's like. Okay, so let's shift gears again. You also have kind of a personal coaching and mentorship business going as a, as a side hustle, I think, right? Can you tell I, well, us about I, that? I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. necessarily say it's a business. It's certainly something that I, I gravitate towards and I feel really strongly about. Mm -hmm. And it's where my theme for the year, Elevate the Vision, is my, and I, I do this with my team, is just trying to elevate those around me. Um, anytime I can offer some uh, feedback, advice, information, experience, whatever it is that somebody comes to, to me or I see need, as a need, I don't hesitate to jump in and I'm, I'm happy to, to give, you know, my advice and my knowledge. It's something that I've, I've thought about when I saw that question or when we talked about it earlier, I thought, well, he's reading my mind because I'm thinking that's <laughs> something I'm going to do post NARPM career. So, so yeah. Well, good for you. So hold that thought, I guess, if you're interested. Well, actually, Kelly, you've been pretty uh, forthcoming and like, hey, if anybody wants some help, you know, approach Kelly. She seems pretty open to that. And yeah, your background and your knowledge and everything you've been through in building your business. I mean, you've got this great DNA and this great fabric of your culture. So I'm sure you could help, you know, a lot of companies in that regard. Well, listen, I, we, we talked about this before we started the episode. I'm a, I'm a storyteller. I, when I meet with new clients, I always like to tell a personal story about myself. And I was, uh, God, I was on Ethan Lieber's podcast a couple of weeks ago and he, he kind of started digging into my background and I was like, Oh no, here we go. You know, I'm going to have to tell this story because I always get a little emotional when I tell it. Cause it, it's, I always feel a bit vulnerable about it. Right. But yeah, I, I did. Yeah. And, and it was cool. And I hosted a, a breakout session at NARPA national in Phoenix on this very topic. So what do you got for us today? Is there a, is there a defining story that you could share with our listeners about Kelly and maybe how your life was shaped by, or maybe your business career by something that's happened? Well, actually there is. Yeah. And I don't, I don't get into it very often, at least the, the origin of it. But, um, but when I was a young girl, um, and it, I just won't take that long. I'm not going to go through all the years of my life. So You're good. we want to hear it. <laughs> so when I was uh, 12 years old, my father passed away from bone cancer. And I guess in today's world, maybe there would have been a better treatment and so mm. on, but this was in the early mid seventies. And it, of course it was shocking. And then a year later, uh, my, my father had been sick for a year, so it wasn't unexpected that he would pass, but at age 11 and 12, yeah, it was, you didn't understand that. A year later, I had a sister, a younger sister who went to school one day and never came home. And she had passed away from an aneurysm that burst in the base of her neck. So within a year, I'd lost my father and my younger sister. Oh my gosh. That, that was, you know, a pivotal point in developing who I became 
And what I, what I realized as, you know, fast forward into my 40s, um, I realized that I was living with fear, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like when was the next tragic event going to happen? And all these years I've been living with this. So I um, had the opportunity to uh, see some skydivers one afternoon. And I thought to myself, that would be really fun. I, I'm oh, more of a man. wind person than a water person. one of person. my I'd... biggest fears, jumping out of a plane. Yeah. Well, like I told you earlier, I never would have jumped out of that plane. I did a tandem jump and that guy behind me that I was attached to, he pushed me because I would never have jumped. I, I just would have gone back down to the ground. However, once I did it and I, once I was in the air and I realized I lived, I was, I have never been as afraid as I was sitting at the door of that plane and, you know, I remember looking back at the expert dive, you know, skydiver that I was attached to just with carabiners and he had the parachute on his back. Um, and I said, you've done this before, right? And, and then he just, we just scooted out of the plane and off we go. I get scared just thinking about it, right? And once I did it, it just unleashed the opportunities that I had been afraid of prior Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if I can, so many times my mantra became, if I can skydive or jump out of a plane, I can do this. If I can do, if I can jump out of a plane, I can do that. And all of those things. And it really opened things up for me, especially with my leadership within NARPM, because there was so much fear about what I could, what could go wrong that I, I could overcome those things. And I, I started taking more risks and I know like applying for a leadership position in NARPM to some would not be a risk. For me, it was a huge risk. You know, it, like I mentioned, it took me four opportunities to become an RVP and I kept trying and trying. And so um, that to me, that, that was a pivotal moment in my career. And it gave me, it gave me the license, if you will, to um, try new things in my company. If they don't work, then you shift, you move, you, you move direction and you maybe don't have all the answers and, and it's okay if you're, at least moving forward in a direction without fear. And that's overcoming that fear of just being afraid all the time was a big pivotal moment for me in my career, in my life, personally and professionally. Sounds like it sounds a really cool story. Um, and one that's, you know, it shares a little bit about yourself and the, the things you're able to do now because of having that experience. I have to ask, what was, what was like the first five seconds like? Because to me, this is terrifying. I, would, I don't think I'll ever do it. So, <laughs> when, you, when you were in the air falling out of a plane. <laughs> so you, you have the opportunity before you, at least at the place I went to here in our area, you can um, pay a little extra to go a little bit higher in the plane. So your free fall is a full 60 seconds oh versus a 30 second free fall. So I decided go big or go home. The thing that I remember is, I, and they tell you this in the training, that, but you're com the air is coming into your mouth so hard that you have to really force yourself to breathe out because your lungs are filling with the air that's coming in because of the gravity. And so I felt like I was going to suffocate. And so I was pushing my breath out and then it gets pushed back into your lungs and forcing it out and, and just, I don't know, it was an incredible experience. And then all of a sudden he pulls the chute and it's just entirely peaceful. Yeah. And it was, it, it was, I would do, I landed Bob and said, can I do that again? It was so <laughs> exhilarating. And so I haven't been back doing it again, but um, it was, it was really, and I think about all the different things I've done, you know, like speaking at convention in front of 700 people, I think, well, I've been skydiving. How hard can this be? And it yeah. is pretty hard. It's scary, but I draw on that experience a lot. Um, well, it's a cool story and I love your go for it attitude. And I can tell, you know, it's done a lot for you in terms of your willingness to put yourself out there. That's a hard thing to do. It is, you know, uh, to put yourself out there. And like you said, shoot on goal multiple times to the NARPM organization to say, Hey, I'm here. You know, what do you think? Could I yeah. do this? And then look, look what you've done now. So we're eager to learn more about NARPM under your presidency. I can't wait to go to the PM exchange, uh, leadership exchange yeah. next week and also NARPM national. I'll be doing it virtually uh, just because I'm all the way in California and right. can't leave home that week. But um, Kelly, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. I've really enjoyed meeting you and learning more about you and your interesting background. 
I would love to continue, but just in the interest of time, we have to kind of wrap things up. So any last right. words for our listeners about NARPM, about, uh, you know, your thoughts on NARPM or the PM Leadership Exchange and how can they reach you or get a hold of NARPM if they wanted right. to do that? So you can reach me at president at narpum.org. That's probably the easiest email to get to me. Um, and I, like I said, I'm really open and um, willing to share with people at one of the last um, uh, PM exchange things that um, Second Nature did. There were two people in the small group and we were exchanging ideas and we've been meeting every Monday ever since. So, you know, it, I am certainly willing to talk to people. I'm not, I, I, people say, oh, you're so busy. You're so busy. I think we're all busy. And I have to say, since I'm not traveling and, um, you know, I'm, I, those that you can't see, I'm wearing my NARPM president name tag today because I get to wear it when I can, because <laughs> I'm not wearing it at the meetings. Um, so I'm not as busy as necessarily as I would be had I been traveling. And so I would just encourage people to reach out. The other thing I want to encourage I want to encourage all of us as property managers and in the industry and landlords that we can do hard things. And this year hasn't been easy. And every day we get up and we come back at it again. And I posted on a, uh, I think PM exchange has a Facebook group. I had three contacts with people, tenants that were so pleasant last week that I keep holding on to that because I know it's going to shift. And there's been weeks when we have really difficult conversations with people and people are not kind. And I just want to encourage everybody that we can do hard things and to keep at it. And don't, don't give up, just keep at it. And reach out to your colleagues, whether they're NARPM or not, and just say, hey, I'm having a tough day. Um, and I just need a vote of encouragement, so. Well, gosh, I, it's really inspiring to me to hear, you know, hear you speak. Um, can't wait to um, hear more from you. And I hope we can maintain this, connection that we've yeah absolutely today. yeah and I look hey to it. another another uh kudos to you you're now a brainstormer you're an official brainstormer you've been, oh, yay. <laughs> you've been on the brainstorm show so thank you so much for joining yeah. today really appreciate you coming on and as we wrap up today i'd like to make another quick plug to our listeners to please click on the subscribe button and give us a like and pay it forward with a positive review because that helps encourage more great guests like kelly to come on the show and that concludes today's episode. Thank you for joining the Property Management Brainstorm Show. Until next time, we will be in the field working hard for our clients to maximize their property value and income and maintain top tenant relations. And we'll catch you next time.